Known for his fire red hair and his iconic always stark white survival t-shirt, Stewart came to the G.I. Joe team in 1987 as the resident survivalist. Did you know the word on his shirt is actually an acronym? Let's talk about him. Before we do though, let me say thank you for watching JLS Comics, whether you've been with me for a while or it's your first time here. If you enjoy the video, don't forget to subscribe and share it so you and your friends don't miss the content I upload just like this every few days. Let's jump into the story. Stuart Selkirk, codenamed Outback, was born and raised in Big Piney, Wyoming. Big Piney, sometimes referred to as the icebox of the nation, is close to Bridger National Forest. And so the entire area really allowed for a young Stuart to come into his own and develop his survival skills and extreme weather tolerations. His impel card says that he'd been climbing mountains since he was a kid. He's jumped ravines, rappelled down ice-covered peaks, and scaled cliff faces that would give professional climbers the chills. Eventually, Stuart enlisted in the United States Army and joined the infantry where he excelled. He conducted classified operations in Central America and clandestine operations, as his file card states, in the Middle East and as an expert in SEER, became an instructor at survival school and at the Jungle Warfare Training Center. This probably means he was operating out of Fort Sherman in Panama sometime during this period of his life. One file card says, most people are intimidated by wilderness. They don't feel comfortable in an area with no sign of human life for miles. Not Selkirk, he believes in being part of his environment, not its adversary. Regardless of how inhospitable the location, he knows, like few others, how to physically and psychologically endure any conditions over any distance and terrain for as long as necessary. So, as for his shirt, broken down the word survival makes up key components of successful survival and it's a core guide used by the United States Army and U.S. Army Rangers in their survival field manuals. The S means size up the situation. The U is undo haste makes waste. R equals remember where you are. V is vanquish fear and panic. I equals improve your situation. The second V is value living. A is act like the natives, and L is learn basic skills. So all of this exceptional skill and fortitude earned him a spot on the G.I. Joe team, and so Larry Hama added him in the 59th issue of Marvel Comics, a real American hero comic book in the spring of 1987, the same issue which saw Tunnel Rat join up. It's an issue which also featured the Slam Cannon, a commercial for that toy, which starred out back as well, aired on TV the same year. In fact, he's firing away from the Slam Cannon at a pogo piloted by Cobra Commander, which is right on the cover of the issue. Inside the issue, the Joes were testing their new artillery in the desert of Utah. On the way back to Fort Carson in Colorado, while well, in the foothills of the Rockies, Hawk told the armored column to halt, and they stopped to link up with Outback. And while they were testing artillery equipment, Outback was doing testing of his own. He was testing survival equipment. He'd been dropped off an entire month ago and a full 600 miles away for the field test. But he said it all fell apart after the first week, and he'd just been living good off the land ever since. Cobra Commander and Apogo found them by way of Raptor's bird friend, and he chased them down the highway. And Outback actually leapt from the Havoc to the APC, which was towing the Slam Cannon. So he wanted to jump in that while it was being towed and engage Cobra Commander. They got away when the Pogo failed. And then two issues later, Outback, along with Stalker, Quick Kick, and Snowjob, were tasked with rescuing a journalist from Barovia. The government needed total secrecy and plausible deniability, so the four Joes were officially discharged. When they got in country and assaulted the building where Winchow, the journalist, was held, they found he'd already been released. And that's when things quickly went foobar. Stalker ordered Outback to escape just before the others were captured, sentenced, and sent to a Barovian prison labor camp. The story from issue 61 continued to G.I. Joe Special Mission 6, which chronicled his E&E &E efforts through the sewers of the city as he was being pursued by the military. When Outback got back to the pit, he was met with icy stares and a cold shoulder from the team. They thought he'd abandoned his team and left them all behind to save his own hide. Bound by his secrecy, he was unable to retort, unable to tell them the truth, and when Leatherneck went in on him really hard, he said, Answer me, you slimy sleazeball. All Outback could do was keep his mouth shut, but he pulled a knife on him. And fraught with rejection from his team and guilt over wondering if he'd made the right choice or not, despite it being an order from Stalker, Outback became depressed. And it wouldn't be until issue 67 when the captured Joes returned triumphantly, although worse for the wear. They said that they were very happy that Outback had gone back and that he had helped to save them by telling them that they were there, still alive. It said that the Joes at the pit should know better, allowing Outback not to feel so guilty about what had happened. Shortly after their RTB, after being captured, as told in G.I. Joe's Special Mission 27, Outback was in Mexico along with Stalker and Quick Kick at a resort, lounging poolside and enjoying some R&R. &R. 
At one point, Outback and Quick Kick were on a bus tour to some Mayan ruins when Mexican revolutionaries attacked. He was still on R&R when the Cobra Civil War broke out, so he wasn't part of that conflict. In issue 80, Outback became field commander for Rumbler, Charbroil, Muskrat, Hardball, and Hit and Run. He and his team had to take a rocky, unstable new island in the Gulf of Mexico before Cobra was able to. And it was a very intense firefight, but the island sank anyway, so it was all for naught, as Hit and Run said to Outback at the end. Flint, Outback, Shockwave, Sneak Peek were outside Castle Destro in Scotland, and Recon later on is... The nearby gypsy encampment and the carnival were both revealed to be a cobra assault force and they got out of there really quickly on a swamp smasher. We see him much later once Larry Hama picked the series up back in, where he along with Dusty was on base perimeter security detail. This was issue 61 which seems to be his primary assignment now that he's on base. Later when Darklon escaped from Joe custody, Outback jumped in a hammer along with Muskrat and Ambush to go find them and they tracked him into the hills surrounding the base. They thought they were in pursuit, but he was actually under the hammer the whole time as they rode out into the desert. And then as night fell, Darklon got the drop on the trio from a cliff with a sniper rifle. And Outback snuck up on Darklon's nest, but it was empty. So he popped a flare into the inky blackness of night, just as Darklon aimed at Muskrat. And in the light of the flare burst, Darklon's rifle was hit and broken. And Muskrat actually thanked Outback, thinking it was him. But Outback said it wasn't him. Turns out it was Lolite. Darklon got away, but that ended up being the plan anyway. Outback was sent into Ollie's stand along with Dusty, Bazooka, Clutch, Covergirl, and Throwdown to recon a revanche facility in the desert. Covergirl told Throwdown that they're going into the desert with Dusty and Outback, and there's nobody better in that environment than them. Issue 211 has a really cool cover of Outback atop Covergirl's Wolverine. In the issue, they ran into a shadow track filled with Sand Viper, Blue Ninja, and Red Shadow Troops, and Outback suggested to Covergirl to use her body as a distraction, so she did, while the rest of the team ran up behind them with shovels and giant wrenches, and they took their uniforms, stole the shadow track, entered the revanche building, and there they discovered they were building this giant mech robot. After another uniform change and assistance from Covergirl and the Wolverine and Bazooka in the hover with a SMA, they made it out. Outback was there in his purple viper gear when Dusty got the radio call that Snake Eyes had died. Later on, Outback met Spirit's parents while on leave and a trip to Taos, New Mexico, which was issue 220. To his surprise, they were not indigent. No, Ingrid and Javier were a brain surgeon and an artist and quite comfortable. At the end, their leave was called short as Cobra World Order kicked into its next phase, although that was the last time we've seen Outback. But rest assured, wherever there's trouble, Outback is there. He's out there somewhere, probably on a deep insurgency mission, thriving off the land, and he'll be back again when Larry Hama needs him, perhaps the latter part of this current snake hunt event we're in in the summer of 2020. In G.I. Joe's Special Mission 13, Outback was with Dusty and Trucial Abysmia, along with Mangler and Lightfoot, two soldiers who were in a probationary sort of tryout status, and they ended up blowing up a weapons cache, and Mangler died while covering the escape of the rest of the Joes, and a little dead, Outback put in for a decoration for his actions for Mangler. In the Devil's Do Run, during a fight with a cult called the Coil, Outback was shot and severely injured, although he did survive. In Action Force, which was reprinted in European Missions 11, Outback was in the Australian, well, Outback. Psych Out had to go see him because he was acting sort of crazy. And why was he in Oz? Well, he was hunting Dreadnoughts. He stole the Thunder Machine and they chased him through the desert in a Razorback. And it was this whole crazy situation. But Psych Out ended up passing him on his Psych Eval. Unfortunately, because of the time of his debut, Outback did not make it into the Sumbo cartoon series. The only time he was animated was for the commercial for the Slam, which I mentioned, which aired on TV in, in 1987 which was just at the same time that Outback's V1 action figure debuted. Outback was on the box art for the Slam as well, the strategic long-range artillery machine. The next year, Outback became part of Night Force, now packaged with Crazy Legs, and this was a Toys R Us exclusive. In 1993, Outback became part of the Battle Corps line, and interestingly, he was supposed to be a part of the Eco Warriors, but that subteam was canceled, and, and so Snowstorm and Outback were reassigned before they could make it to the Plan 93 releases, so that's when they went to Battle Corps. There was a DTC version, direct-to-consumer version of Outback in 2008, sold through the G.I. Joe Collectors Club, and the next year, he was in a box with the Flat Cannon versus Cobra Claw set, along with Air Viper Commando. He was in the 25th Anniversary Assault on Cobra's seven-figure set, and in 2014, Outback was in the G.I. Joe Convention's Zombie Initiative set, and his loadout was pretty different here, full of edged and long-barreled weapons. 
In 2016, he was also part of Tiger Force, packaged with sneak peek and female Doc, aka Carla Greer, as part of the G.I. Joe Collectors Club again. The other Outback in 2016 was part of the 50th anniversary line, and to differentiate it, was clad in all black and came with both Shooter and Falcon in his Special Forces 3-pack. And so there you have it, folks, the story of Outback. For now, that's a wrap on this one, my friends. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to subscribe, turn on notifications, so you can be one of the first to know when I upload videos just like this each and every week. I'm Jesse, this is JLS Comics, and I'll see you soon.